It was Andy Warhol himself who said that in the future, everyone will be famous for 15 minutes. As it turned out, Warhol has enjoyed plenty more than 15 minutes of fame, and he may be leaping to a new level of global interest with the upcoming Pittsburgh Summit. That's because the White House selected the Andy Warhol Museum as one of its official venues, the setting for a luncheon involving the spouses of the world leaders that will be visiting here on September 25th. Tom Sokolowski is director of the Andy Warhol Museum. Welcome back. Good to see you. Likewise. You know, this has got to be, even for the Warhol, and you guys do things all around the world, this has got to be to a whole different level. Oh, so it certainly does, because someone asked me, one of our trustees who's away for the summer, well, what will this be like? And I said, well, I've taken through Mick Jagger, and Joan Rivers, and the few ambassadors, and even Monica Lewinsky. <laughs> and that was always the most exciting, obviously. But this, to have 19 spouses of the, the G20 countries, and all they represent, and all the attention that can further bring to the museum is just splendiferous. It's, it's really amazing. Now, you're no stranger, the, the Warhol is no stranger to the G20 countries, though. No, well, we, of the 19 countries, and the 20th being the European Union, we have done shows in 15 of those 19 countries, and in a number of them, Germany, United Kingdom, Australia, Britain, we've done shows innumerable times. So I think perhaps one of the ideas behind the choice of the Warhol was to show what someone, a little working class guy from Eastern European roots, could turn himself into and our museum, which really has shown the world something about the city of Pittsburgh. Well, it is. I think a lot of people, they hear about the Pittsburgh Symphony and all its successful tours around the world. They may not think automatically about the Warhol as being a cultural ambassador for Pittsburgh. Well, in the last seven years, we have shown Warhol exhibitions, and these are just the ones we mount, let alone people borrow from us, to over seven million people. I mean, and that beats the Steelers <laughs> and their eight games a year, whatever. It certainly beats the symphony. And it's not about, you know, playing a, a testosterone contest, <laughs> but it's the fact that these images are so arresting. And I'll further with that, Bill, what's interesting is it's usually when people are building a brand new wing or a brand new museum or celebrating a 50th anniversary. They want something that just bespeaks modernity hmm. and bespeaks excitement that the 60s were. I mean, Morrill's first period. And uh, there's not a time that it's not thrilling. I mean, one good example, the uh, State Department asked us to do a tour um, around the, two, the 2000, around the millennium, to Eastern European nations, talking about America, and they wanted to do Warhol. And I remember we did a show both in Moscow and St. Petersburg, and at that point, it was just, you know, post-Glasnost, and there was still, we did a symposium in, in Moscow, and I remember someone denounced Warhol, saying, oh, this is Western capitalism, what have you. Then about five years later, when Alcoa opened its first large plant, in Moscow, this, the site of the, the, the scale of three football fields, they wanted to, you know, hang the flag, so they asked us to do a show. Well, just in those five years, the opening had people on stilts and drag queens and people painted in silver, and everyone had cell phones, and it just shows you sort of the world that Warhol bespoke was there just in five years what a, what a sea change it is remarkable what, what do you think's given andy warhol such legs around the world well i think he because he, he was someone who came from the bottom of, the, of our caste system in this country certainly in those years of depression he observed what he didn't have and even as a child he was wise enough to see what others had and to learn he once said if you want to be successful learn what people want learn what people like you know it's as some as opposed to saying you know so and so could sell ice cream to eskimos he was saying well if people want to be warm you sell blankets and everything that warhol is about whenever we try we just have a show on now in bogota colombia <laughs> and i went from there when that opened to paris and then on to london and you ask young people all over the world whether they're artists or just people who like arts and culture and music you know who is the most important person for you and you know to a one it's andy warhol because it's about pop music it's about movies it's about buying small things like a cell phone you may not be able to afford a car or a house but you can have a cell phone and that makes you feel cool <laughs> and that's true whether it's the kids of pittsburgh or bogota colombia or paris where there's a great divergence in economic prosperity and he knew all that he understood that and he understood that really making good art was a business, not just in terms of the financial rewards, but the fact that if you have a business relationship with someone and it's good, you work with them on and on and on. And if it stinks and they screw you up, you never go back to them again. He said, business art is what follows art, and I'm a business artist. 
Interesting. And that's a little bit of Pittsburgh in that, and too, because yeah, it's definitely. a town that's a bit about business, right? Well, you know, it's funny because people always think of Warhol as sex, drugs, and rock and roll, and there was a bit of all of that. But the one thing I like to show pictures of and say, you know, this kid grew up during the Depression, and for him, working meant getting paid. And if you didn't work, you didn't get paid. And, and we had a little show of Lou Reed once, the pop musician. And we talked a little about him, about his interface with Warhol. And he said Warhol would constantly say to him, Lou, how many songs did you write last night? Oh, I was out and I met a babe. And you know, No, 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 you're a songwriter. How many songs did you write? Because he knew if you made more widgets in the factory, you made more money. And if you weren't there because your kid was sick and you had to take them to the doctor, you didn't get paid. Hmm. It was about work. It was about hard work. And that's why he was so successful. You put genius next to hard work, and how can you fail? Amazing. Well, it's a terrific. It's just a great, uh, a great thing for Pittsburgh, obviously, for the Warhol Museum to, to host the spouses of the Group of 20. Congratulations. Thank and you. Good luck with it. Well, thanks so much. Yeah. Appreciate it. We'll be back in a minute with a little dollars and cents. Stay with us. Since the announcement of the G20 summit in Pittsburgh, pundits and some Pittsburghers have been scratching their heads as to why the White House chose our region. Others know that there are lots of good reasons for a Pittsburgh setting. And you can find more than a few at www.pittsburgh20.org. In fact, the website features a section geared toward wannabe ambassadors for our region. You can find key messages about the strengths of our region, and over the next few weeks, information about the G20 countries and their cultures. Soon, volunteers will be able to participate in training sessions that will entitle them to wear Ask Me I'm a Pittsburgher buttons to truly help to welcome the world to our region. To find out more about preparations and to register for an upcoming e-newsletter at pittsburghg20.org.